Thank you for visiting Pastor Wyatt TV, the YouTube channel of PastorWyatt.com. Welcome to the show today, everyone. And today our guest is Jose Santos Jr. He's a jockey agent for multiple jockeys and multiple racetracks. So we're going to have a nice candid conversation with Jose and uh, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you. Pleasure. Pleasure to be on. I appreciate it. No, great. You know, I think that um, uh, it's always interesting, the question that people say, well, like, oh, you know, they always want to get the top jockey, but that's where the agent comes in. I mean, yes, everybody wants the top jockey. So uh, is your role as the agent, how do you decide which horse you're going to ride other than the fact that one is much better than the other? What are the decisions yeah. that come into play? For sure. Um, I would say, for instance, uh, in a situation right now, like uh, where I have Julian riding so much for Kenny McPeak over at Oaklawn, unless it's like an extreme circumstance where, you know, this is a horse that I, I'm being asked about that I'm going to ride down the line. I'm going to, you know, stay loyal with him because he's putting us on so many winners. And same situation with Ray Lou right now over at the fairgrounds with Calhoun, you know, unless it's one of those situations where it's just a horse I can't really miss out on. I'm going to make sure that I've got them covered. And uh, the way I do that is both are really, really easy to work with, which is a huge help. And, you know, right when the book comes out, they're ready to go over it and tell me where they're headed. So I can kind of fill in the blanks from there. And, you know, while we're going through that, I can tell them, you know, hey, I've got this situation. Would that be a problem? And, you know, they're, they're both extremely honest people and easy to work with. So it's it's it makes it easier that way as well. Great. And uh, let me take one step back. And obviously, you're the son of a pretty famous jockey. So I guess the natural question is when you were young, did you want to be a jockey? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's all I wanted to do. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to be a jockey until I was like 15 and then I, I just got too big. Gotcha. Gotcha. And um, has your dad given you any tips along? Obviously growing up around him and the business has been a big advantage. Absolutely. Yeah. That's kind of where, you know, most of the tips really came from was just sitting back and watching, you know, not just him, but, I've uh, just been fortunate to kind of be around so many people in horse racing. I've done so many great things. Uh, my sister's godfather is John Velasquez, you know, and my dad had so many great agents and, you know, family, friends, everyone, you know, as you know, we're all close knit on the racetrack. So I've, I've been exposed to, to everyone, you know, from the beginning and it's been extremely beneficial for me. And what age did you start being an agent? When I was 16. Oh, wow. That early. Yeah. Early. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I did it great. like a summer job over at Calder. I would take mm -hmm. like this guy who he didn't have many mounts back then. His name's Eddie Dominguez. And I would take him during the summertime. And then during the school year, my mom wouldn't let me do it. But I would <laughs> do that all summer. And I did that my junior and senior year of the summer before I went to Kentucky. Then I moved to Kentucky when I was 18 to go play soccer at Bellarmine University. Mm -hmm. And it didn't take very long to find my way to the racetrack yeah, from there. Yeah. Yeah. That's um, it. Uh, similar only, story. Similar yeah. story for me. I, I came down to Cal State Northridge, just outside of Los Angeles, and the goal was just to concentrate on school. But Santa Anita was way too close, so yeah. obviously that didn't that didn't happen. Well, I did both. Put it that way. So, yeah. um, and could you tell us the current lineup that you have of jockeys and what tracks you're at? Yeah, so uh, I've got Julian Leperu, Raylu Gutierrez, David Cabrera, Manuel Esquivel, Fernando Hara, Adam Basquitza, Freddie Manrique. So it's a pretty pretty solid lineup of riders. Super happy with them. Uh, we're over in Oakland right now. That would be Manny and Julian at the fairgrounds. I've got Raylu over at Sam Houston. I've got David Cabrera, Fernando Hara, and Freddie Manrique. And then at Turfway, I've got Adam Basquitza. And like I mentioned at the top of the show, uh, this is a very unique situation because I don't think there's another agent in the country that has as many uh, jockeys as you. I did notice some are starting to branch out. Yeah. Uh, like with Joel Rosario, Frankie DeTore, and and others, you know, they're Ronnie Anderson's got them kind of spread out coast to coast. And mm -hmm. what most tracks, you can have two jockeys. And there's some smaller tracks where you can have three jockeys and one of them can be an apprentice. Uh, some of the tracks that I raced at at Turf Paradise, a lot of the agents had three jockeys. At um, Santa Anita, you can only have two jockeys. You can only have one apprentice. So there's some of those things, but you have it to where you have a couple jockeys at every different track. So how 
obviously that's very busy and a lot of work for you. Uh, do you have any other people on the ground or are you doing it all yourself? No one on the ground, uh, more behind the scenes with like gathering data of what horses are kind of on the ground per se. And then I'll take that and try to group fields together, but just kind of, uh, I guess I would call it data collecting, you know, some data collectors that'll go through some of the tedious stuff that, uh, kind of anybody could do in gathering and grouping horses. And then from there, I'll, I'll review it. And if you don't mind saying, and you don't have to, but um, what are some of the tools that you use in handicapping other than watching replays? Yeah. Uh, thorough manager. I'm on thorough manager a lot. Uh, not so much for their numbers, but more so how easy it is to group horses together and go through charts. So I like thorough manager for that. And then when it comes to handicapping, I, I use daily racing form and the rags and sheets. Gotcha. And I know that, as you said, when relationships are built and you really get along good. And a lot of times I think as a, as a handicapper, you know, you always know the trainers have a go-to guy. So once you get that, you know, this jockey's riding really well for this trainer, or they're just really clicking, um, you know, that, uh, that probably makes your job much easier. But then on the flip side, whenever somebody else wants to use your jockey and your your main guy has a, a, a mount for you, it's a little difficult, even if they may have a better horse. Right. Yeah, for sure. And that's going to happen. But when you're riding so often for someone, you know, it's a it's a volume thing. You know, it's kind of like and my, my dad told me this early in life, you know, don't don't look five yards ahead, look 50. You know, and that's kind of the situation that arises with that. And fortunately, like I said, the most of the people I do business with there and most of the people I really think in horse racing, you know, I mean, of course, in any business there's going to be people you don't mesh with or anything like that. But everyone's super reasonable. And so long that you're honest and prepared well ahead of time, you rarely run into super big blow ups. Well, I've I got to know you over the last couple of years and some of the stops I've made, and uh, I've, I've just seen you mature and grow as a person. So that's obviously only helped your business from the time you started at 16. So um, congratulations you. on all your success. I, I wanted to explain to the viewers, because I know a lot of times uh, back in the day, people would say, well, let's get Pink Eye or McCarran, but and they always thought they charged more. And, and they're really, uh, can you explain how the jockeys get paid? and that they, they they don't charge more they may make more money but they don't charge right. more. yeah no they, so they get paid actually directly from the racetrack so you'll see the purse in a race we'll, we'll talk about a winning situation let's say they're in a hundred thousand dollar stake race the jockey's going to make a total of six percent of that purse now the way that's broken down is the winning horse gets 60 percent of it and the jockey gets 10 percent of that 60 percent that the winning horse got so the jockey in a hundred thousand dollar race will make six thousand dollars and that's whether it's mccarran or you know one of my guys so there's no there's no extra fee for a rider like mccarran who's an yes. all-time great but uh exactly. yeah it's, just, it's really just you know planning it out and hoping it's a situation where they're going to be available and uh, most tracks and correct me if i'm wrong but most tracks are 10 percent to the winning rider five percent for second and third and then a losing jockey mount for fourth and below correct yes that's that's most situations and this is something that I, I think is kind of a gray area, even amongst a horseman. Now, some trainers or owners, they'll come to a jockey and say, hey, I'd love you to ride my horse in this stake, and I'll guarantee you 10% across the board, meaning first, second, and third. Does that right. happen a lot, or does that happen not very often? I would say that is common when shipping a rider out. When, when you're shipping them out of town, especially if it's going to be a situation where it's the only horse that they're riding and they've got a full slate, you know, at the track that they're leaving, I, I've heard that situation before. Gotcha. And I say, um, so, and then obviously if you know some people in town where you're shipping, it's, it's kind of nice. It's always a double-edged sword because you don't want your jock to get hurt on somebody else's horse when you went to ride a stake race for, for somebody mentioned. And the other thing that's nice about, uh, jockeys and and again you could shed some light on it for the most part when they are shipped out of town they're usually traveling first class is that correct yeah for the most part yeah uh i, I would say for the most part especially if you can plan it out you know ahead of time when prices aren't too pricey for something like that but yeah i mean we definitely try to find the most efficient way to get there you know that's for sure because a lot can go wrong so 
And, and sometimes because they're riding the day before or the next day, they either have to take a red eye or leave early in the morning to make it. So you definitely want them as comfortable as possible. Um, did you um, uh, recently have anybody in Saudi Arabia, in the Saudi Cup or any of the races no. there? So this weekend during the Saudi Cup, Julian went down to Gulfstream. He's based okay. at Oakland and he rode uh, five stakes at Gulfstream and one undercard race. Uh, we got real close. We had three seconds over the weekend. Mm -hmm. Two of which yeah. in graded stakes. One was on the undercard allowance. Uh, we had a really nice, promising filly run fourth in her first race off a layoff. So it was a good weekend. Second in races like the Devona Dale and the the Honey Fox, or you know, of course, you you want to win every race, but mm -hmm. they're stepping stones to you know really big races throughout the year. And the horses, you know, proved the class that they had shown before, and that was that's always exciting. What is what's your feel? Uh, because you have a pretty fairly sized stable of jockeys uh do they all get along they're obviously if they want to be with you they're on board that you are going to have other jockeys in different tracks yeah I, I, from what i know they all get along you know they uh I, I think they all know each other maybe julian hasn't met like freddie or something like that but he definitely knows fernando from when fernando was riding in new york and julian was getting started uh i think the year that julian won his first race is also the same year that Fernando won the Belmont and the uh, Dubai World Cup and all that, the Breeders' Cup Classic. So he definitely knows him. And Julian knows David from David shipping around throughout his career. Uh, I think Freddie, the only one that don't know each other is Freddie and and uh, Julian. But they, they all get along. I mean, you know, they rarely really run into each other unless they're riding on the same circuit. That's what I was curious. Are any of them going to clash coming into Keeneland or Churchill? Yeah. So unfortunately, uh, me and Adam have to split ways because the mm -hmm. uh, the role is two for Kentucky, which sucks because we're, we're really doing really well right now. And mm -hmm. Adam's a great guy to work with. I mean, I yeah, really I, I, I don't know him personally, but I can tell you just from a, a fan, I, I just hear his name all the time, which means – the announcers announcing and the winning jockey adam yeah. i can't hardly yeah. pronounce the last name but, yeah, but, but i know who it is <laughs> yeah no he's a really good rider and uh it's really unfortunate that that's the way it has to be but uh when we hooked up for the winner he mm -hmm. knew that going in you know I've, i'm committed with julian and Ray Lou on the circuit i'm extremely happy with the two riders i have and you know uh, when he asked me to represent him because his agent was going down to the fairgrounds and didn't want to do both the circuits I'd worked with Adam before and uh, it was a no brainer. And fortunately we've done really well. We got fourth in the first meet and I believe we're in fourth place right now. It's, it was, it's been close, but the other day he had five winners on Friday, which nice. was awesome. We won, yeah, we won five races for five different trainers, which I've, I've won five on a card with a rider before, but I've never done it with five different trainers. So that was, that was a lot of fun. Excellent. I know uh, one of the traditions and uh, you know, the, the jockey agent, the winning jockey agent, so to speak, usually sends donuts to the barn the next day. Is that uh, something that you make sure they get? So what, what I've been doing is barn? Zelling, I've been selling people. There you go. They can, you know, set it up themselves, which that's been that's been working pretty well. People have been equally as happy with that. Perfect. So, no, I feel like the fairgrounds, they have a great system. I can text the lady at the kitchen and then she delivers the food. Oh, nice. And then she'll, so she'll call them up and, she, you know, what do you guys want? Breakfast, lunch, since the kitchen's open at all hours, they just say, hey, we want breakfast or we want lunch. And they'll tell them what she wants and she'll bring them over. And at the end of the meet, I write her a check, which is. I, I know that I, I knew as a young, you know, the last few years watching your career develop and you getting more riders and being more technology savvy than some of the counterparts, some of the older gentlemen that have been uh, agents for a long time. I was like, oh, this, 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 I'm surprised, you know, nobody's come as close to what you're doing, but, um, but it's really nice to see you use the cutting edge kind of technology communication. And I really think that you're, you're obviously the hub behind it. I mean, you are the one that you're, you're giving realistic expectations. You're communicating with the trainers and obviously all the jockeys. And that's another thing that I wanted to mention was one of your jobs, and maybe you pass it on to maybe, an, uh, like you said, a background assistant, but texting out the jockeys, their workers for the morning, because I would say at least six days a week, these jockeys are working horses in the morning as well as riding in the afternoon. So that's another part of your job that you don't actually get paid for, uh, but you will when the races come. And especially if your jockey knows the horse because he's worked them in the morning. So uh, how does that work for you scheduling your workers? 
Yeah, the same. So I just uh, I have a calendar in my phone. When somebody reach out to me about having a worker, I just instantly put it in my calendar. And usually around the same time, about 6 p.m., I'll start sending off the text. You know, hey, this is what our schedule is going to be for the next day, unless it's requested earlier, you know, or if uh, it's like a travel situation where a rider has to be, you know, let's say they're based in Louisville and they have to go to Lexington in three days, you know, I'll give them a heads up, hey, you know, in a couple of days, we're going to be in Lexington early in the morning because it's a little tougher of a morning, you know, that instead of starting at Churchill where, you know, they'd probably wake up about 520 to get there for the first set, you got to get started about, you know, 530 to make your drive out to Lexington. So, mm-hmm. or four, sorry, 430 to make your drive yeah. out to Lexington. Add, so, add an extra, an extra right. hour to your trip. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. So I like to give them a heads up on stuff like that. Or uh, for instance, if it's an off day and they're based at a place that isn't where their actual home is, you know, uh, you know, let them know, hey, I'm gonna need you to stay back Monday morning. And then if you're if you are going to go home, you know, it'd be mm-hmm. best if you went home Monday afternoon. Yeah, because a lot of these um, horsemen, but especially jockeys, um, a lot of them might be in Oaklawn and they're in temporary housing for four or five months. Uh, right. They might be at the fairground. Same thing. They might just be renting a place. And and some guys just get a hotel. It's very nice and it's easier. You don't have to furnish it. And you just, you know, you're staying there. But you might be there three or four days a week and then you're home two or three days a week. Right. Yeah. And uh, Julian's been doing that a lot. Ray Lou's been going back to his home in Louisville a lot or New York to go visit his family. So uh, if I know that something's going to happen on an off day, I, I try to give him a heads up that way. Gotcha. What about um, as far as these, you know, obviously we're in Derby season and the Kentucky Oaks, um do you have any mounts on the horizon that are looking good for you for either the derby or the oaks yeah uh so as i mentioned before we're riding a lot for kenny mcpeak right now and he's got three horses on the top 20 leaderboard so uh one of which we've ridden which would be northern flame he ran third in the rebel the other day uh he'll be running in a derby prep next he's mentioned a couple different spots so not exactly sure what the plan is there but it will definitely be a derby prep so Hopefully, you know, something shakes out with that. And then in the Oaks, that into Champagne Philly, we just got second on the Devona Dale. She's got a really good shot. Uh, Adam's riding Epic Ride right now for John Ennis, who I believe his next start will be the Bluegrass. So by then he'll be with his new agent, Bryson Cox. But uh, yeah, definitely have definitely have some options and a lot of races on the undercard stakes as well, which is super exciting. Gotcha. You mentioned Bryson Cox. He's another, you know, a trainer's son who came in and and decided to go the agent route. Um, he's got a young jockey, Alex Concepcion, if if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. He's got Axel and he'll have Adam. So those and will be Adam, okay. nice, yep. nice little lineup there. So yeah, that's for good. sure. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm buddies with Bryson. He, he does a good job for sure. Good. I know that um uh you mentioned McPeak and he was like, I think he going a little bit back he won the the three-year-old boys and the three-year-old fillies uh that one weekend the, yeah so he, he's really uh been hitting on all cylinders at oakland park so it's good that you're riding for him and and uh he's he's always on the on the mix when it comes this time of year he's got something for the derby something for the oaks uh he just he's he's really done well so yeah he said uh right now he said he's got more horses than he's ever had so he's uh oh. Yeah, unbelievably grow, a growing stable, and uh, he he just wins, like you said. He's very well prepared and easy to work with. So, uh, going back to uh, Cox, is it hard when his son, you know, to get in Brad's barn when the son is an agent as well? Uh, I mean, Brad's put me on a couple horses this year. I'm, I I guess to a degree, but you know, Brad he's he's got riders he's been using for a long time before Bryson was riding. So it was always kind of difficult to get in there. You know, he's uh he's got a really big stable and everyone wants to be in there. So he's it's <laughs> yeah. uh it's a long line of riders trying to to ride for Brad Cox, that's for sure. Gotcha. And um who are some of the other top uh uh trainers that you said you're currently riding for? Uh, I do a lot of business with Brett Calhoun. Uh, I do a lot of business with Carl Broberg as well over in the Texas region. Uh, Austin Gustafson is another guy with a big stable who I do a lot of business with in the Texas, Oklahoma region. Uh, been working a lot with Ignacio Correas recently with Julian. He's been going back the last few weeks and working some horses for him, getting ready for Keeneland. Uh, John Ennis is a guy I started working with recently during this uh, last Turfway meet, and he's been on fire. He's got a lot of really good horses, and 
He's always been dangerous in the two-year-old game. So I, I expect him to have a big Keeneland as well. And really, we, we try to try to do business with as many people as we can. You know, I want to for sure be available to everybody. And, you know, you want to ride for everybody. So uh, that, that, that's if we good. can make it happen, we, we sure will try. Um, what do you do in the situation? Uh, a rider gets injured. And for you, you're lucky because you have other jockeys. But right. if you're an agent or when you were starting out and you only had one jockey, when that jockey gets injured, you're kind of out of business. I mean, the jockey might get workman's comp and have some injury insurance. But as an agent, you're kind of kind of out there on your own. Uh, that kind of was one of the driving forces behind this. You know, I've uh, been fortunate to be in the industry my whole life. So I've seen the good and the bad and what you just said. I mean, it was some. it happened to me. You know, I'd been... 22 years old being an agent and, you know, trying to make it not a lot of money rider gets injured. I'm without a job for two months, you know, and I'm working week to week as it is. So, uh, yeah. first time that happened, I was like, all right, how do I find a way to, you know, avoid to where when that does happen, I still can, you know, make a living for myself. And, uh, that was my idea. You, you got to have multiple jockeys if you're going to do that. Same way with the train. I mean, if a trainer only had, two horses, you know, and one of them gets hurt, they've just cut their income in half, you yeah. know? So, uh, it's, what, uh, would you, what would you say? Um, like, obviously I think from the outside looking in very successful, is there guys that come at you and kind of say, Hey, this guy's got two jockeys over here. He can't have jockeys over here. Or have they pretty much left you alone? Uh, in the beginning, they, they definitely, came after me a little bit, but I mean, I'm not, I'm not breaking any rules. They're all in separate <laughs> states. So mm -hmm. essentially, you know, I had people go to the stewards and like, well, he's got two jockeys here and two jockeys there. And they're like, well, here's the place that we, you know, hold jurisdiction over and he's following the rules here and he's following the rules there. So, <laughs> there you, you know, so, uh, no, yeah, that's it was, it was, I guess, uh, not very well perceived right off the start, but most, you know, that's a lot of new things when things have been a certain way for <laughs> X amount of time when somebody tries to shake them up and I completely understand, you know, where they're coming from on that. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, changing times. I would say that there's a lot more agents going out of the game than coming in. So mm -hmm. hopefully, uh, so these riders can have the proper representation. A lot of these good agents that we have around, which there are a lot of them, you know, can start, going this way because uh, at the end of the day, I'm just trying to do the best job for the riders that I represent and, you know, make a career out of it myself. And, you know, I, I, I can't be the only one thinking that way is the way I see it. Mm -hmm. No, I, I really uh, admire what you've done and, and you've, you've done it well, obviously uh, you know how it is when, when jockeys are, they're athletes and they have a little bit of ego. We, we don't, we don't have to hide that fact. And so if one's winning and one's a little quiet, obviously there's always going to be a little bit of uh, tension and you have to always try and balance things out. H how do you work with that balancing the riders and keeping their chin up when they go through a little slump? Yeah. Uh, I would just say an open line of communication is probably the best, best way to go about it. Uh, everyone's going to go through slumps. I'm going to go through slumps where I pick the wrong horse a lot. Riders are going to go through slumps. Trainers go through slumps. Horses go through slumps. I mean, Every, everybody goes through some form of slump. So just keeping that open line of communication, let them know that, you know, it's a safe spot to talk to me if they're feeling a certain way about something. And, uh, you know, just every rider I have is, I truly believe a very good person and, you know, hardworking, good ethic, you know, they, they want to be successful. So a lot of them, uh, they can see, you know, both sides of it. And just because one of my riders is doing good, it doesn't really mean anything about their career. You know, I, I try to do my best to keep them all separate and manage them all as their own career because there is, it is their own career. The only thing that they have in common besides being a jockey is the fact that I represent them. You know, they all have their own lives and their own responsibilities, their own goals, their own careers. So, you know, just once I know what those are, I just try to manage it to what they're looking for to my best ability. And one thing that I wanted to kind of, you know, let the viewers know, kind of a behind the scenes with agents is really what would you say your contract is with a jockey? Is it just a handshake or? Oh, definitely. Yeah. That's, that's all the horse racing, I guess. Yeah. It's, it's all handshake contracts. Uh, in Oklahoma, they do make you sign like 
a waiver. Like if when you're going to say you're going to represent somebody or the beginning of any meet, you have to sign a contract with the rider that this is what they're going to pay you. This is the percentage. And then you have to like come in and say when you are no longer going to be working together. That's the only state that makes you do that, that I'm aware of at least. Mm -hmm. And um, how much does an agent make when a jockey makes their gross earnings? 25% of whatever the rider makes, we get paid. And then that's all before taxes. So we have to file taxes at the end of the year on all that money. We don't have the taxes taken out throughout the year. So it's something you got to keep in mind, you know, like you'll get a check, but you have to remember that like, that's not, it's not all that. <laughs> yeah. You got to save a little sum for Uncle oh, Sam. Absolutely. Yep, absolutely. Um, there was one track and I don't know if you've come across this, but one track I raced at called Emerald Downs. It was the only track that I saw where they would actually take, the deduction out for the jockey so the track paid the agent really and i know 99 wow. i've only had one i've had one track do that for me it was hawthorne and the rider requested it yeah this one was oh, almost you like and ask you know that's their business but the mm -hmm. yes mm -hmm. if it was okay if the check could go directly into account for myself and if i called hawthorne and did it that way. And I mean, I had no problem with it. So sure. Whatever works for him. So it definitely, you know, it's easier accounting. Uh, but like you said, most of the time you probably get your gross earnings for the week and then the jockey pays you a check once a week. Yep. That would be, yeah. Okay, good. That's and, and, um, one of the last couple, uh, items, you know, what, uh, what are your goals as an agent? Like, do you have any for your yeah. riders or for yourself? Yeah. Uh, well, first, my first goal is to meet their goals for sure, because that's when I take on a new rider, I definitely ask them, you know, where are you looking to get out of this? Where, where are you trying to head to? You know, what's, what's your goals? So I want to make sure I'm meeting their goals. Personally, I want to win a Kentucky Derby. I think that's everybody in horse racing, though, you know, yeah, but uh, yeah. I was really fortunate as a child, you know, my dad won the Derby in 2003 and uh, that was the best. That was just the absolute pinnacle of anything I've ever experienced. And I, I, I want to experience it again. Yeah. And as far as if you weren't an agent, what, what do you think you would be doing? I don't know. <laughs> I've, never, I've never had a job off the racetrack. There you go. Well, never, I think we can started so it. young. Yeah. yeah. When you started so young, you were like, well, I'm going to go to college, but mostly to play soccer, not to. Uh... Right, exactly. It was really to appease mom. I was trying my <laughs> best to not go. She was, she was She's adamant. Like, you're she you're only work, you're only working in the summers. You're yeah. going to school, and you know, yeah. you're going to college. Yeah. And you said, big well, if I can play I soccer, work. if I could play soccer, I'll go to college. So. Yeah, no, she had really big dreams. That I wouldn't work at the racetrack, but that was just never <laughs> going to happen. Like, <laughs> so. like, I said, you were born on the track. So what, what yeah, could you expect? Exactly. Right? Yeah, you know, my so, mom, uh, a lot of people don't know it, but her side is all horse racing too. Her brother, oh, mm -hmm. her brother was a rider and her father was also a rider. Wow. And her mother, my grandma, she was a horse trainer. Oh, wow. So, that's cool. You know how it is when you grow up on the track. It's either yeah, like, oh, and, everything, yeah. I'm all horse racing or like stay away, you know. <laughs> said, There's said, what no in between. There's no like, you know, just no feelings about it. Like you're one or the other. That's it. All in. Mm -hmm. yep. That's great. So I got, I'm, I'm the only one who went all in. I've got nine siblings. Uh, oh. wow. I've got one little brother who loves horse racing. So we'll see. Mm -hmm. And uh, okay. I've got two little sisters that like horses, but they like the show jumping mm -hmm. and the rest of them. I mean, you'll be pulling teeth to get them to a racetrack. So. <laughs> all right. Good deal. Well, Hey, I really thank you for coming on the show and spending some time today. Um, I think people will get a little behind the scenes of, you know, what these jockeys someone like you that represents them and and then also what how you've taken being an agent to a new level um so con continued success and i know you're going to win the derby so it's just a matter of when we're going to try we won't yeah. stop until we get it done that's for sure good deal good deal well i look forward to talking to you and uh i really appreciate the time no thank you i had a great time appreciate you having me thanks Tracking trips with Pick 6 King, John Stetton. It's one of the best tools in horse racing for any level of player. It's your second set of eyes. Spotting troubled trips, betting angles, track trends. 
Horses to watch and favorites to fade. Ten figs, ticket structure, and more. At Tracking Trips, you're a friend with benefits. Not a member? You must hate winning money. Join Tracking Trips now. Visit PassTheWire.com and we'll see you in the winner circle. Remember, nobody does it better. Jackie's Warrior, quickly in front here by two lengths. Here comes Jackie's Warrior up the inside to take over the lead from Life is Good. And Jackie's Warrior remains undefeated here at Saratoga, and he wins an unprecedented grade one stakes at the spa for the third straight season. Nobody does it better.